Good morning. My name is uh, Lieutenant General Guy Thibault, the President of the Conference of Defense Associations. And on behalf of uh, uh, our members and our sister uh, association, the CDA Institute, I'd like to welcome our member of parliament, uh, James Bazan, who is the representative of the Conservative Party of Canada. James is the elected member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman in Manitoba, and he's previously served as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Defence and has been a critic for agriculture and national defence and knows our community really well. Thanks for uh, having me on the podcast, uh, Guy, and congratulations on your uh, role. I know you've been in it for a while with us. Uh, uh, CDA, but uh, I know it, 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 it's uh, something that, that uh, you're going to do a great job at and that uh, the, the organization is going to be well served by having you at the helm. James, uh, welcome. I will be asking a series of questions that we would like to explore with all of the, uh, the parties and uh, really looking uh, for your responses to help educate those members uh, who are interested in defense and security issues as they head to the polls on the 20th. So without uh, further ado, if that's all right with you, uh, the first uh, thing I would really like to talk about is uh, uh, touching on defense policy. As you know, the most recent defense policy, a Strong, Secure, Engaged, was uh, developed uh, after the Canada First defense strategy developed by the Conservative Party. And the uh, Strong, Secure, Engage was done with extensive consultation with Canadians, security, defence stakeholders. And from your party's perspective, what uh, changes are needed to our defence policy and why? I would just uh, say this on, on defence policy. One, first and foremost, defence policy should never just be put on the desk and allowed to collect dust. Uh, it uh, should be a living document uh, that uh, needs to change with the times. And SSE is already, uh, you know, uh, five years old. And I said from the beginning that it was more than likely a book of empty promises uh, by the Liberals, uh, which it has proven to be. Um, you know, even uh, the, the one thing that I did like about SSC at the beginning was that the, that the emphasis was on the uh, brave women and men who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. And of course, what we've witnessed, especially over this past year, is that um, you know, that hasn't been a concern of the uh, arm uh, of, of Minister Sajan or of Justin Trudeau and how they dealt with uh, ensuring that we have maintained both the um, morale within uh, within the armed forces, the trust in leadership, and uh, have, have allowed sexual misconduct to, 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 to fester while they turned the blind eye. So I, I would just say that, you know, they, they took the Deschamps report, you know, six years ago and sat it on a shelf and let it collect dust. They've done the same thing with Strong, Secure, and Engage. We've seen uh, a lot of military uh, funding that have lapsed and Virtually on the procurement side, a, a lot of projects haven't moved forward the way they should. Uh, and, uh, you know, you look at fighter jets as, as a case in point where they continue to kick the can and, and punt those decisions down the road. And do you think that uh, just on, on that, uh, were there things that were kind of missed in SSC that uh, from, uh, from the Conservative Party that you think needs to be kind of added to the mix? Well, you know, although there was some consultation done in the development, they were very uh, specific who they allowed to consult on the development of SSE. I'd also say that they uh, did it in a vacuum. Uh, you know, all to, you know, we need to always make sure that foreign affairs informs defense policy and the foreign affairs uh, was done at kind of the last minute at the 13th hour on the back of a napkin and then presented in parliament a day before uh, the, the SSE was actually presented to the public. So, you know, there, there, there is that concern that it wasn't done in that collaborative effect of, of, of looking at national security, looking at our interests on the, on the national international stage and how we better position uh, the use of our armed forces to bolster Canada's reputation in the world and take on those national security threats that are, you know, festering in, in, in offshore lands where we all too often have to deploy our troops uh, to, to ensure that those threats do not uh, come to our shores. And so, you know, that is, is, is what was sorely lacking uh, in, in that forward-looking uh, fo focus on SSE. And uh, that's one thing, if you look at our um, entire platform, uh, you'll see national security, national defense, and foreign affairs all lumped together and were developed in collaboration. 
All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And maybe you can just uh, kind of then expand on that uh, in terms of uh, if the Conservative Party forms government uh, within the within the context of your overall priorities, what would be perhaps some of your top uh, three priorities that you might have for national defense and security? Uh, you know, obviously the issues of cultural change, we may come to that in a moment, but I'm really trying to step back a little bit and see at the, the more strategic level, what you would see as being some of the big uh, first priorities for defense and security? So the couple of things that we are talking about, both on the national security side, as well as on the national defense side, is that we need to have more ministerial accountability. And so we are talking about having a minister of national defense with the, 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 the authority to get projects done. All too often, we're waiting years and sometimes decades for some of these procurement projects to come to, to fruition. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we can make those strategic investments and that there is somebody that, that is held to account for failing to, to deliver or to, to stick handle the puck so that these projects get through the various levels of government, whether it has to go through uh, industry, you know, justice uh, and, and that national fence. And of course, you know, that, that, that great big hole called, um, you know, public, public procurement and, and public services. So, you know, we have to get through, through that um, pro process as well. So making sure that, that everything is handled in, in an appropriate manner so that we get the kit that our troops need and deserve. The other one in, in this is also having the expansion of, of, of what's happening in public safety and actually have a minister for national security and public safety, realizing the fact that, that the, the threats facing can today on a public safety level are often international in scope. So it, it's dealing with everything from, from cybersecurity to foreign actors and foreign interference and influence in, in Canada uh, and, and making sure that all the departments that are responsible and have bits and pieces of, of that from foreign affairs to CSIS to CSE to national defense to the RCMP are all better coordinated again under that type of ministerial responsibility on the national security file. So I see that as being two major steps forward that, that we're pr proposing in our platform under our narrow tool conservative government. And then of course, the big thing is, is expediting some of these procurement uh, projects. Uh, it is about ensuring that uh, we're able to, to do the tasks at hand, be not trusted ally uh, in, in, in the bigger sphere, whether it's under NORAD, whether it's under NATO uh, and uh, getting, getting the, the, the equipment that we desperately need Fighter jets is case in point, like that one needs to be done now. The competition has, has pretty much run its course. A decision needs to be made and those jets ordered so that we can continue uh, to defend our, our sovereignty uh, and participate in NORAD and NATO missions uh, that are required of us uh, on an ongoing basis. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, obviously, defense procurement has been a, been a challenge for uh, uh, forever, really, uh, it's it's difficult to to move the uh, these kind of capabilities through the machinery. So, you know, I appreciate uh, appreciate that uh, that focus. Uh, certainly, that might be brought from from your party uh, on the issue of funding. Uh, funding has uh, also historically been a been a challenge. Uh, the Department of the Canadian Armed Forces comprise a very large percentage of the discretionary spend of the government of Canada. And, uh, you know, we've got the NATO targets of 2%, both uh, conservative and liberal governments have uh, really never been able to match the level of amb ambition that has been set for, for, for spending. So when you look at uh, the, the current uh, layout of uh, finances in the fiscal framework, uh, do you believe that uh, from your party's perspective that the funding is adequate for both the operations and the capital funding for, for defense uh, and the Canadian Armed Forces? And, uh, and how would you see addressing some of the big capability gaps that are identified, whether it be NORAD modernization, whether it be dealings with issues of space and cybersecurity and, uh, and the like? There's a number of uh, capability gaps that might identify that strong, secure, engaged doesn't really cater for. So I'd really just like to get your kind of sense on the overall commitment of resources for, for national defense from your party's perspective. And I realize you know this firsthand as the former vice chief of defense staff and how difficult it is to, to do, you know, the budget side and get the money rolled out the door and, and, and address the needs of, of the armed forces. And so um, it, it, it's an ongoing issue. And I often hear from people that, you know, national defense can't spend the money they're getting now. But at the same time, we know that there's reprofiling the dollars happening there all the time. And, you know, you, you, you talk about the last budget uh, that the liberals presented that half the new money that was going into or so-called half the new money that was going into 
uh, NORAD um, modernization, uh, review of the North Warning System, and uh, other investments uh, were money that was actually taken away from infrastructure that modernizes our bases and wings across this country. So we need to ensure that um, you know those dollars that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, you know, we are committed to, to balancing the books, but we also see defense industry and the Department of Defense itself as being something that can stimulate the economy. And so we do believe in investing heavily in, in our own sovereign capabilities of defense uh, industry. Uh, and you know, I think the one thing that was exposed through this pandemic is where you don't have control of supply, you're at the... Uh, I guess, bequest of, of, of other nations. And, and so within, you know, our, our closest allies, and I, I look at, at our proposal of Kanzuk of having a closer relationship under uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, uh, that, that that type of sovereign supply should be controlled under that, those, those four nations, of course, along with our NORAD partner, uh, the United States. So, Yes, we, we have to uh, make some, some major investments. We know that NORAD modernization, including the North Warning System, is going to be a big tick, ticket item. <clears throat> but this is by far our most important uh, collective defense uh, agreement that we have as a nation and the one that affects us directly here at home. And so although the Liberals have $25 million to look at, um, uh, at, at the North Warning System, um, that's a drop in the bucket to the tens of billions of dollars it's going to cost to uh, increase the scope of the North Warning System, to update it, to expand it so it covers the entire Arctic archipelagos, which is something that we believe in uh, as conservatives. Uh, we know that we need to have more satellites up under the radar sat constellation. We know that we need to do, uh, look at the low uh, Earth orbit satellites as, as ways to keep eyes on the ground in, in our Arctic territory and uh, the use of drones, both above ice and under ice as ways to, to provide that ongoing surveillance that we need. It requires dollars, it requires resources, but it also presents opportunities that we can piggyback some of this infrastructure that we're gonna provide uh, that will provide a uh, higher quality of living uh, to, to those that live in, in, in the Arctic regions of Canada, uh, such as making use of satellites for telecommunications, uh, making use of new uh, bases and ports and, and, and uh, forward operation locations for, for as, as airports and, and ability to bring in more trade and provide that infrastructure to, to, to the residents of our Arctic. Okay, great. Uh, maybe we can just change uh, track uh, just for, for a moment. You kind of mentioned it in your earlier comment. Um, obviously, the issues that have been surrounding uh, the treatment of women in the Canadian Armed Forces and the overall inappropriate conduct. Uh, we all agree that women in the Canadian Forces, all members of the Canadian Forces, deserve to be uh, safe and secure in, in uniform. Uh, and uh, when they make a complaint that they will be addressed. What specific kind of thoughts uh, right now do you see from the, the Conservative government in terms of additional actions that should be taken? Obviously, we've got the Arbor uh, report, which we will expect will be coming. But what do you see uh, as being kind of next steps here? Well, I don't know how many justices uh, and former Supreme Court uh, judges that we need to actually look at this to know what needs to be done. Uh, we, we had ju Justice Deschamps, we had Justice Fish, and now uh, Justice Arbor. And so it just continues to go on and nobody's making decisions. So this is where political leadership is important uh, of, of bringing about that culture change. And this is where uh, we've said as conservatives that we need to have a truly independent outside of the armed forces uh, reporting system for those that are facing uh, sexual misconduct and harassment. So that uh, needs to be created in a safe place. And so whether that's uh, moving the, the, the sexual misconduct response center outside of the Department of National Defense, where it can't be influenced um, by, by um, those in, in positions of authority uh, is something that, that uh, has to happen. Uh, we've said that we need to make the uh, Defense and Canadian Armed Forces Ombudsman independent and as an officer of parliament. Uh, so that is something that uh, we, we want to uh, pursue and uh, how big a uh, scope we make that and what powers we give is, is something, of course, that, that, that uh, we, we have to go through. But I visualize it being very much similar to the way the Auditor General operates already, uh, reporting into the Public Accounts Committee. So I would see the, the, the Ombudsman or, or the um, 
you know, whatever the name we decide to, to give that individual, um, be reporting straight into the National Defense Committee and giving the, the Defense Committee the, the ability to, you know, look at the reports and act upon those reports and take that back to back to Parliament through that process. Um, so, you know, there, 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 there needs to be that type of independence and be more responsive to, to the needs. Uh, and what we just saw happen, um, you know, uh, to Gary Walborn and uh, now with Ombudsman Lick as well, saying that that, that that office needs to be independent. I think that starts that change and it will, will change behavior within the armed forces as well for those that are abusing their authority at, at the upper levels, but also, you know, in, in middle management and as you get down to, to the rank and file members to ensure that, that we're setting the example that we are going to be completely intolerant to the sexual misconduct because everyone that serves, whether it's a woman or a man, deserves to, to operate in a safe place, um, especially when you look at, at, at the tasks that we look at, at, at putting uh, armed forces into. Like when you sign up, you sign up knowing that you may be going to war, but you didn't sign up to, to um, be sexually assaulted. So let's uh, get, get our priorities straight and let's support them uh, as, as, as warriors and, and take away um, the, the misconduct within the workplace so that they can come to work uh, and, and uh, feel safe and secure from that standpoint. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for that. Obviously, a uh, leadership uh, challenge, to be sure, for, for the leaders of the Canadian Forces. And uh, there is a role, I think, for all levels to be helping uh, make sure that we've got the right workplace, uh, not only for members of the Canadian Forces, but a national defense right across, uh, right across government. And, and Aaron O'Toole has, has said that we need to make sure that the leadership within the armed forces is reflective of, of, of Canada today. And so we need, need to see, uh, you know, more... more um, minorities and women, you know, uh, in, in command positions and uh, ensuring that that uh, that will change in itself, the, the culture and the way people interact with one another. Uh, so, so we want to make sure that that uh, those that have been marginalized and uh, uh, are, are actually um, through merit based processes are, are um, being, being uh, brought forward and, and uh, promoted up our ranks. I know we're going to be running out of time here shortly and uh, probably got many questions that I'd like to kind of explore with you, but let me, uh, let me uh, take, uh, take things one step up uh, now and just talk a little bit about the, uh, the world we're, we're operating within. This comes back to a little bit of our, our, our issues about defense policy and kind of how we position ourselves. We, we're dealing with uh, security challenges from a great power competition. We've seen Russia and their actions. We've seen increasingly intransigent uh, China. Uh, who are threatening the international uh, uh, rules-based system. Um, what, would, what changes would you be thinking about uh, or would the party be thinking about in terms of our relations with the, uh, uh, with the international community and relations specifically with, uh, with uh, countries like Russia and China uh, as we kind of look to defend Canada's uh, national security interests? So our international alliances are more important now than ever. We're living in a more dangerous world than what we've witnessed in, in, since the fall of the, wall, great, uh, of, of the, the Iron Curtain. So, you know, we need to uh, um, increase our participation within NATO. Uh, we need to, um, you know, strive towards that 2% of GDP spending on as an aspirational target. And, you know, we, we have to always be, and Canada has always done um, you know, uh, punched above its weight in participation within uh, NATO uh, and especially in Eastern Europe. So, you know, we want to ensure that the Americans and our NATO allies can depend upon us, that we are pulling our, our fair share. Uh, the 2% is, is, is a metric that, that is often thrown out there, but it's also about participation. And so the more that we can do in uh, Baltic air policing, uh, in uh, our EFP Latvia mission, uh, increasing our, our role in, in, in those two alone will help uh, distract and, uh, the, the uh, Russian influence that we're seeing in that area and the Russian aggression. We want to do more in Ukraine, uh, not just uh, under the current uh, uh, training mission that we have there, but also let's, let's, let's supply Ukraine with the lethal weapons that it requires to do the job in, in defending that sovereign territory in Donbass. And, and of course, we'll never recognize Donbass or Crimea as, as, as Russian territory. On, on the China side, we've been very clear that, that, that the, the communist uh, regime in Beijing um, needs to be uh, kept in lockstep and, 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 and in check. Uh, we, we are uh, suggesting this, uh, that Canada join the quadrilateral security dialogue, quad itself of, of, of the United States, Australia, Japan, and India 
has that new focus in the Indo-Pacific region. It's where Canada should be as a Pacific nation as well uh, to, to, again, uh, be monitoring uh, Chinese geopolitics and, and, and their um, expansionism that, that we're seeing in the South China Sea with them building islands. Of course, uh, under the communist regime's Belt and Road Initiative, they have the Silk Polar Road where they have interest in our Arctic. So we need to bolster that and work with our allies to protect that sovereign territory of Canada. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's more that needs to be done and through those, those strong relationships with our allies are where Canada, I think, will have a greater influence uh, on the international stage, as well as provide greater security for us here at home. All right. Well, James, uh, I know we're at the end of the time that you have available, so uh, I think we'll just uh, we'll we'll stop it there. I'd like to thank you for uh, for taking the opportunity here to share a few of uh, your thoughts as well as the the party's thoughts on defense and security issues. Um, I'd also like to just thank you for your your public service and your strong uh, commitment to, to the Canadian Armed Forces and to defense over the years. Have a chance to to, to see you in many different uh, contexts over the years. I know you're a uh, you're someone who really believes uh, in, uh, in the men and women who serve, and you're also doing that yourself through your continued public service. So I'd like to uh, wish you all the very best uh, in the upcoming elections and in your own, uh, your own uh, aspirations for, uh, for, for government. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Thank you for, for your continued service to our uh, brave women and men in the armed forces, because, uh, you, you know, we can do what we do and live in, you know, and live in this great nation. Uh, all too often Canadians, and we talked about this before we started broadcasting, is that Canadians often don't talk about defense issues during election time, but our peace and prosperity is only possible because of those that serve, not just those that have served in the past and, and, and fought in numerous conflicts around the world, but they're the ones that are protecting our, our, our trading lanes every day, whether it's the guys with eyes in the sky and NORAD 24-7, uh, uh, or those that are uh, watching our maritime approaches and our Navy going out and protecting that space, uh, or our armed forces who, who go and uh, keep great powers like Russia and China in check. So, you know, that is something that all of us need to always remember. And that's why we have to continue to invest uh, in our forces, both at a personnel level, but also on our capability level. And so uh, maintaining a, 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 a fighting force that's ready to deploy at a drop of a hat is important to, to our great nation. Great. Well, thank you, James. And for all of our viewers, uh, you'll be able to find uh, the uh, key elements of the Conservative Party of Canada's uh, uh, campaign uh, election on our CDA Institute website as well. So thanks. Uh, thanks again, James. <laughs>